my heart passed along a lot of your eyes first spoken to myself. And another word of power tonight, my dear brother, and I love these little books. I love these little anecdotes, the histories, the little pen pictures, these little gathering together of information that everybody knows and then putting it into a book. It's part of the history of Ireland, part of the history of the parish, part of the history of Limerick. Wonderful levels of love, lovely, lovely little stories, lovely little pictures. Not the pictures you haven't seen before, probably the majority of you haven't seen before. Uh, and a labour of love for mine. And uh, great credit to him. And uh, it will be on sale shortly, so please buy a copy. You can also buy a copy for your friends abroad, because that's what I do. I buy copies and send them off for people to stay connected, which is very important. We all stay connected. You know, ladies and gentlemen, when I was asked to do this little job by the distinguished management committee of the Kenry Literary and Historical Society and culturally, <laughs> I was both uh, flattered and the surprise, to say the least. I mean, Michael's book deserves to get the best launch you possibly can get, and deserves the best people that you can possibly have to speak on behalf. So why on earth would I be asked? Well, I was just a runner in. I said, how on earth would I know anything about the corner or its history and so on? And it made me think a little bit about my own existence in the corner. And adding up the years, it suddenly dawned on me that I've been living here for nearly 50 years. I couldn't believe it. In a half a century in this little parish. In a half a century put me right back into the second part of my book. That made me think a little more about it. It never crossed my mind, of course, that perhaps I couldn't get anyone else to do this job. But that's why I was asked. I dismissed that straight away. <laughs> it's kind of sobering to think that when you reach a certain age, that automatically you become part of history, part of history of a certain place, and part of history of Kilcarnan in our case. There's nothing wrong with that, but of course it's history with a small hitch. It's history of our local scene, our local neighborhood, our hinterland. So looking closely at the book, after all of that, I said, my goodness me, <laughs> I recognize so much of it and so many people in it. I knew Joe Barry well. And many times I followed his footsteps up through the woods of Car Chase, following poor defenseless pheasants, and had a nice cup of tea with him in his kitchen range afterwards. Uh, and I have the fondest memories of him. I stood in Paddy Wallace's forge, working forge, and heard all the talk about horses and politics. It's a shame that Paddy, who had two sons, none of them followed him in that. Uh, one of them joined the regular commissioners, I think. And I thought, I'd have the other one off to Dublin, and I don't know what became of him. <laughs> none of them, none of them, anyway, for the outstanding profession of blacksmith farrier. I heard Marty Cooley sing his favorite song on many occasions. It was a song about the half of it. Some of you may remember seeing him. I don't know if he was leaning on the half of it or looking up over it. It was at the drop of a hat, down in Peter's, he would see him. Heidi McDonough. On the great occasion with John Nash, Heidi McDonough told us his life story. Very interesting one it was. When Radio Erin were 
trying to bring what they call community radio down to this area, to all of the country, but they came to Askeaton and they brought Kit Cornyn into that. And I got the little assignment at the time of presenting a little topical discussion with a panel composed of Joe Cox, Paddy Connell, and Peter Sheehy. I'll talk of laughs. For 40 minutes, they just bounced wits off each other. And of course, all kinds of, you can chalk it down, and just so, just so, all the wonderful expressions and terms that those people were renowned for, and the funny stories and occasions that they were able to recount. All I had to do was sit back and let them have it. The producer was delighted, and indeed he was heard to say afterwards, that's what I mean by community radio. Jim Doe was a feature of this parish for so many years, and I remember him well and complimented him, <coughs> along with everyone else, when he got his papal medal for the services to the parish. Mickey Gibbons, along with his Morris Minor, was an unfailing supporter of our little whist lives in the old school. So all of them, and the others, of course, simply walked out of the pages of this book. And Michael, I can tell you that it gave me great pleasure and very pleasant memories to read about. There was one person, however, I hadn't ever met, and having heard about him, never wished to be, even though he bore my own name, and that was the Reverend Patrick Lynch. Now, he seems to have been a right tough character. He was the epitome of the domineering priest in a domineering Catholic church at the time. Not a nice man by all accounts. All of them anyway, brought to life by Michael, and the older stories about the current chase, buildings, people, and places, sits very comfortably with the stories of the more humble folk. And of course, that's the essence of local history. Now, in an ever more bewildering world that we live in, instant communication, worldwide access, Facebooks, and all of the things that go with modern life, it's a kind of a comfort and quite interesting to know that books on local history are still the top sellers in parishes and baronies all over the country. Let's hope that it remains so in the future. Because, of course, the story goes on. History doesn't finish. But every now and then, it needs someone to chop it down. It needs someone like Michael. And people like Michael are very valuable. They should be carefully nurtured and encouraged and supported insofar as we all can do that. And indeed, as that as far as that goes, young people should be encouraged to talk to their grandparents, for example, and to write down their stories. Everyone has a story. And of course, the child in all of us loves a story. And that's what makes the whole thing alive for us. Michael, thank you very much for the work. It's your second, and assuredly not your last. Time has given you a whole new series of chapters to come. Uh, and of course, they all need to be shot down. <laughs> they all need it. Momentous things have happened in the short period of a hundred years on the macro level, on the big level, on the big stage. Extraordinary wars and battles and calamities and good things too. And all of them are catered for, not indeed without some controversy, but it is at the micro level, at the local small parish level, that more is needed and wanted and very desired. We have to remember that we work, we live, we enjoy the life, the advantages of modern life, always standing as we do, as they say, on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. 
we forget or neglect that fact at our peril and indeed at our loss. Congratulations, Michael, and thanks again. Come and tell us all about it, if you would. Tell us about your next book, The Carnal, I've forgotten, but The Carnal Remember, Michael Costello. Even though uh, my name is on the cover here, I, I do think that this would be uh, it's a joint effort, really, because uh, all the three years or so that I've been doing this in my spare time, I would have called to for every corner of the parish, and usually without any 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 notice, the people would always bring me in and would uh, give me all the information that I would ask for photographs. And I would call back maybe on a few occasions, and there was never any, nobody ever turned me down. So, this is as much your book, really, as it is mine. And, uh, so I have, I have to thank Peter up to come for helping me out so much on this. I brought the book into a number of sections. The first thing would be to do with college days, because I suppose, Paul Chase is the, uh, the, the focal point of the college. When I finished this, I realized that there's a lot more to Paul Chase than just a typical corner that was Paul Chase. Uh, I was doing research on Paul Chase uh, before I even decided to do a book. And then Michael Holland asked me to do some research on Gilles' dancing platform. Uh, which I did, and I got a lot of information there from Jerry Quinville. <coughs> All the information came from Jerry. And the platform was in the 1920s to the 50s. And Jerry told me to jump in the house. But then I had those two pieces of information from uh, purchase and the platform. So I decided, well, what can I do with this? So I decided I would maybe follow up in the shops and the boards. So, which I, I did, and I realized that okay, we have no shop in the town at the moment, but if you go back in time, we always had a shop, maybe even two shops in different parts of the parish. The best known one would have been uh, Harry Connors, that you would remember that. But uh, there was quite a few more. Uh, there was, I'll mention one from about the 1870s, and Mrs. Carroll. Shandala has a shop, and the aspect of that is just a, a few stones. But, uh, when she needed to get provisions for the shop, she walked to Limerick, and she walked back home again with her beds. So there was that shop, and there was quite a few more shops which I have detailed here now. Some of the shops I have very little information on, and other shops I have a lot more information. Same with the uh, with the quarters. Uh, quite a few have uh, several quarters in in reading that have had to be that we don't know where, we, we know where they were, but the physical footprint is, is gone. But uh, then there are several others where I got quite a bit of information, and I included two from outside the parish, and maybe I shouldn't have but probably uh, with Paddy Wilson's quarters. That's in the Sweden Parish. Not people may not know that. And um, I included a Southern Forge, which would be up by the by, by Cora Cross. And they would have service of work for farmers and those who come of the parish. So that's why I included those. Um, in the another section I Quite a bit, uh, stories from the parish, and this would be a whole a collection of different stories. For example, the, in the water scheme came into Kilcon in 19, 1964 or 5, and I, I detailed that. And also, um, I covered the, the schools, <coughs> shops, Protestant, Catholic uh, schools, also the water scheme. Um, I included a few people that were well known in their, in their own life and like had the had uh, uh, the postman, Joe Barrett, 
Um, I included about four or five more people in that as well. Uh, I tried your guys' story uh, as a one yet, but I remember as a child, my grandmother looking out the window practically every day, and she would look back at me and she'd say, Is the boat from gone yet? Even though the chances are she wasn't getting at any boats. But I think it was the case of she was so used to him passing the house at roughly a certain time, and it probably happened to all over people who keep an eye out for Joe jo Um As I said, I would have a lot of information on some shops and a lot of information on some code, but quite a few others were practically non existent. But at least we, we have recorded them where they, where they once stood. Now, I have one story in particular, please, if I can, uh, the meteorite and the Collins family. And uh, this was a, happened in 1813, where um, a meteorite shower crashed into Count on one particular morning. That was about eight or nine segments hit the ground. And I don't be able to say it was in Kilconnor Parish, but it wasn't. It was in fact in, in Patrick's well. But the Collinses walked in fat and they kept one of the uh, pieces, which turned out to be the largest known meteorite segment to hit Ireland. And they brought it with them when they moved to the town. And in 1947, uh, a council, a mountain council, was visiting their cottage, which is just off the road from here. And he noticed the, the, uh, the unusual stone, which I think at one stage was holding up was going forward in the back gate. And he realized it for what it was, and he got in touch with the, uh, the uh, National Museum in Dublin. And they came down and they paid 100 pounds to the Collins family and gave them a plastic test of it. The plastic test replica has gone, but the piece itself is in the National Museum where you can't see it. It's been stored away and nobody has seen it for many years. Now, there was uh, eight or nine segments, they were quite small. So if anybody wants to see another segment, it's in the museum in the city hall in Nimmu, still there. So, uh, I had mentioned a while ago that there would possibly be a follow-up. Uh, I would hope there would be a, a follow-up, but I, I, I'm not too sure it would be in, in my lifetime. I would hope that some young person from the family, from the parish, <coughs> and I can't say very too young, maybe a fellow, that would maybe in, in, in five years' time might decide to do what I have done and, de and, and detail the common part of 50 years and continue on uh, with the story. Um, I would hope that the book for the older generation here. I mean, people, people have said it to me that it, it, it actually brought them back in time to when they were younger and people that have, have passed away and stuff. And I would hope that the younger generation would read it and kind of realize what life was back then. It was tough enough. And another thing that I noticed really was in the mid 60s when the, uh, the forges closed down, the shops all closed. And we got the water scheme, that that was a time of great change in the Connor Parish. And that's one thing that I took from, from this. So, uh, to finish off, again, I have to thank everybody that took me into the forums and spoke to me and gave me all the information that they possibly could and gave me their old photographs. And they trust me with their photographs. And uh, as I said, without these people, we wouldn't be here tonight. And I want to thank all these people that made this possible. Thanks very much indeed. Still bloom from each tree 
when leaves are still green in December. It's then that our land will be free. I wonder her hills and her valleys, and still through my sorrow I see a land that has never known freedom and only. Our rivers run free. I drink to the death of her manhood. Those men who'd rather have died than to live in the cold chains of bondage. To bring back their rights. Where denied. Oh, where are you now when we need you? What burns where the flame used to be? Are you gone like the snows of last winter? And will only our river? Life, but we're crying. How mellow the wine, but it's dry. How fragrant the rose, but it's dying. How gentle the breeze, but it sighs. What good is in you? When it's aging, what joy is in eyes that can see? When there's sorrow in sunshine and flowers, and still only our river. 